Um, so first off, a lot of a lot of the way that people think about networking is I want to find a mentor. I want to find someone out there who's going to like have a weekly or bi-weekly call with me and tell me what to do, right? And that turns out to be a very ineffective way of finding a mentor. Asking for a mentor turns out not to be a good way of getting a mentor, right? So when you think about networking, the idea of networking is that you're, it's a mutual exchange of value, right? Like your mentor is obviously helping you because they're kind of coaching you and telling you what to do, but you also have to add value. And so when you go out to LinkedIn or you message some random person um, and you say, hey, can you be my mentor? What value are you offering? And so nine times out of 10, or actually I'll say a stronger statement, 99 times out of 100, you will get ignored or you just won't get a fruitful relationship out of a question like that. And so I think a big part of networking in my head is how do you find a mentor more effectively than just this question? And I think the key insight that I've learned um, when I've been trying to find a mentor or at this point where I have this lucky position of being able to help people and be a mentor is that it turns out mentors choose the mentee. It's not the other way around. And what I mean by that is it's your job as the mentee, if you're looking for mentorship, it's your job to show that you are special. You're going to put in the time and the effort and you're thoughtful and kind. And then if I see that you have potential, like, oh, wow, this person really cares. They've clearly done some research about who I am. Then that is how I'll pick you. And then that's the start of a really promising relationship. And so it's incumbent upon you if you're looking for coaching or mentorship that you need to show initiative, energy, passion, right? Um, show me that you've done something. Like, hey, I, you know, I, I'm trying to get my first full-time job as an Android developer and I, I published three Android apps. Cool, you're serious about it, right? You're not just taking tutorials. You're not just, um, you know, like watching YouTube videos about Android development, you're doing stuff. I respect that. And that's gonna make it way more like for people to wanna help you. If you help yourself, you're gonna find people to help you. So here's a script that I tell people to follow if you want to interact with someone who's in a position to give you something, right? This is not just, a mentor, but it could also be a manager, a tech lead, someone at your work, a, a director who, um, who could help, right? So first off, mention who you are, right? Talk about where you come, maybe where you live, uh, you know, what company you're at, whatever is relevant that you think the other person might care about. And also, why are you credible, right? So um, you've built three Android apps. Wow. Like you already distinguished yourself in a way that most people haven't published any app. You published three. Like that's amazing, right? So I already kind of take you seriously. The next thing is, rather than asking for a longer term relationship, oftentimes the best way to enter into that long term relationship is to ask something specific, right? So if, if I've never talked to you before and you send me a message saying, hey, Rahul, could you be my mentor? The level of commitment you're asking for me, which probably is like a multi month relationship, is not commensurate with the amount of energy or input that you've provided me. Right. So you need to give me more than that. Like we need to try it out. And so rather than saying, hey, can you be my mentor? Say, hey, I published this Android app and um, I'm really curious about how do you think about app store optimization? Like what do you what should I put in the description or title of my app in order to get more downloads? OK, now I'm excited. Like you have a really good question. that I actually have a lot of opinions about. I'd love to hop on and talk to you for 30 minutes about that. Right. And the other thing is um, mention commonalities about. Um, why you reached out to this person, right? I think um, it's kind of like when you're doing a sales pitch, right? You don't want to just have a generic sales pitch that goes out to everyone. You want to say, hey, I noticed that you've been interested in this thing or you live in this area where, you know, a lot of people in your area like our product or whatever it might be. And so when you make it clear to them that you reached out to them for a specific reason, oh, we were both alumni of the same school, or we both live in the same city, whatever it is, and you make it clear that you um, did some research, that becomes way more likely that they're, they'll care about you. And then finally, ask for help. Like, actually have a question at the end. Like, that's kind of like the second bullet point as well. But just make it very clear how they can help you. If you say, hey, can you be my mentor? I actually don't know if I can help you, right? But if you say, here's a very specific thing that I'd love to get your feedback on, or I have a deadline coming up two weeks from now, and I'd love for your input. Okay, now there's some urgency, and there's a very clear thing that I can help you with. If you follow that algorithm, that's like four, four bullet points, I feel like your likelihood of being able to talk and network with smart people will go dramatically up. Um, okay, one more 
um, tip about this is around greasing the interaction, right? And so what I mean by that is uh, a couple things. One is you want to reduce the formality. So this depends on the context, of course, but oftentimes I find that um, if you lower the stakes of the interaction, it's more e it's easier for people to actually reply and get to know you. Whereas if you make it like very formal and you have like a lot of uh, paragraphs and bullet points and you send over a resume, say, okay, well, this is now becoming very uh, formal very quickly. And oftentimes it's better just to have that informal interaction uh, before you dive into like a major ask. And I think the guiding principle here is that um, you wanna make it easy for people to interact with you. Right, that's kind of the lower the friction for people to actually engage with you. And so there's a couple of ways that kind of manifests. One is, okay, when I want to talk to you, let me give you three options on how I could schedule time, right? So I'm free on Tuesday from 3 to 4 p.m., Wednesday from whatever to whatever, and Friday, right? But other than saying, hey, like, let me know when you're free, by giving you like three options immediately, it becomes way easier for me to um, actually book time with you and talk. And just in general, like reducing the amount of back and forth is, is a valid principle, is valuable regardless of whether you're networking or talking to a coworker or whatever you're doing. So like, well, let me give you an example of what not to do. Um, I get this message, you know, maybe once a week. Hey, I am an intern or I'm, I'm at this location. I want to get a job. Do you have any jobs available at Tara? So the reason that's not a very effective way of actually getting a job is, okay, did you do any research? Like, do we have a jobs page? Um, do you know anything about the product? Like, do you have suggestions for improvement, right? So when you, like right now, when you might ask this question, you're making me do a lot of work to basically educate you on, okay, here's what Taro is. Here's our needs. Um, here's what level of person we're looking for. If you actually um, do that work for me, then you come across way more respectably. Like I, I take you seriously and you're making my life easier and I'm more likely to engage with you. Yeah, so like including your role, what you're interested in, all that makes it a lot a lot easier. And the final thing is, I, I made this point at the beginning of this section about how networking is a two-way exchange of value. And one thing that people come to me and say, hey, like, I don't think I have anything of value to share. And I call BS, that's never true. If you've been alive for more than 20 years, you have something of value to share. And it may not be like you teaching me about Android development, but it could be your perspective. Like, oh, you know what, I found... Um, you know, the documentation really confusing for a beginner. And I think that it could be oriented different way or your, your, your tutorial was actually kind of confusing. Like, okay, that's great. I actually would love that feedback, right? So you're still adding value just by sharing your perspective. So a couple of ways you can add value here. Okay, so that was a quick rundown, just like some very high level things of mistakes I've noticed from people in networking. Um, or like trying to find a mentor. Let me pause there. Does anyone have any anything to add? I'm sure there's a ton of smart people here. Would love just to get your perspective as well on uh, how people think about this. Did you? Hi, my name is Nikolai Bennett. I'm I'm uh, in New York City. I'm actually from California. I'm from Sacramento, so I'm a fellow Californian. Thanks. My question question is: Did you ever uh, get a mentor? Yeah, I've gotten multiple mentors. And I think the thing, the terminology around mentorship is actually kind of um, confusing. Because I, I, if you, if I think back to like the four or five, six mentors that I've had, the people who have helped me out, I actually don't know if they would describe themselves as a mentor to me, but they certainly are that. Um, like, it's kind of like what I put in an earlier bullet. Like you want to reduce the formality of the relationship. And when you say, hey, will you be my mentor? There's like a level of like distance almost. And I think often what'll happen is like, oh, let's get lunch or let's get coffee. Well, let's work on a project together. And it turns out in the course of working on that project, they become my mentor because I just learned so much from them. So I don't know if there's like a part two of that question, but like I certainly have had tons of mentors. That's, I mean, this idea of mentorship or sponsorship is critical to whatever I've achieved in my career. Um, so yeah, definitely it's been a big part of my journey. Um, Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Hope that was helpful. So here, do you want to? Uh, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, first, thank you for the opportunity. 
Um, I had um rich, well, most recently, I think about six months ago after I came to well, came transferred to my uh, university that I'm at now. I had basically did what you suggested through um your slides, just networking. I had reached out to an engineer at uh, Netflix, just said, you know, introduce myself and did a little research based off of his page and what he was programming in, which he used Java, which is what I which most universities teach. I just reached out, said hello. Um, you know, I worked on this project here. I just wanted some feedback input. Um, can you like give me some ideas and then also some advice on you know getting uh, preparing for um, interviews for you know a uh, first full-time position and it worked and since then we pretty much talk about just about every other day whether that's about programming or life or financial stuff like that nice. and um, yeah just what you what you basically say like you know it's, it's not that difficult to find a mentor or somebody that you know cares as long as you accept like, mutual relationship like you know you're interested in them or maybe their company or what they're doing you know, that will show some uh, interest in you back. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing. Sure. yeah no, I, I appreciate yeah. that. I mean, I feel like it's yeah. Yeah. when you find someone who actually invests in you and cares yeah. about you, I feel like that's game changing for a career. And I think if you talk to anyone, um, they're going to tell you, yeah, there's like four or five, six people who have been critical to my journey. So yeah, yeah. glad you found that. Um, and before I, I go to Mickey, actually one quick thing. I know ESCO joined the call and ESCO I think has been instrumental in not only the whole group, but also just putting this event together. So Ebby or ESCO, do you guys wanna, do you both wanna just say a couple of words or say hi? Thanks, I'm actually driving at the moment, but uh, when, I, when I settle down, uh, I'll say some words. Okay, cool. So well, I just wanna say, yeah, thanks ESCO for, for joining. I just saw your name. Um, and if any, yeah, I mean, just, uh, we can, we can all revisit at the end and we can, we can, uh, hear from you directly. Okay, uh, Mickey, go ahead. Hi. Um, oh, I, I just wanted to make sure that Abby, like if you wanted to say something, please do. Yeah, Abby, go, if you if you are open to it, to say anything. Um, no, not really. Um, I guess I would just say thank you everybody for joining <laughs> us and uh, yeah, that's more like it. And also to thank ESCO because it was um, very helpful with everything. It was wonderful, everything you can for everybody. So yeah, that would be good. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. Um, do mentors in general know of the concept of sponsorships? And if they do, what would you say are the most common types of sponsorships that they do? for a mentee. Yeah, I mean, so I think in general, I think this idea of sponsorship is less well-known than mentorship. In fact, like even for me, I think my first introduction to the term sponsorship is relatively recent. Like I've only ever heard about that or thought about that in the last, you know, maybe three or four years. Um, and so actually make, maybe you can educate me. And my understanding is like sponsorship is basically like you're staking your reputation on this person. Say, so, hey, I think this person can do a fantastic job being the tech lead or being the manager or whatever it is. And so I think it goes a little bit in my head, the difference between mentorship and sponsorship is like you're going beyond the call of duty and actually putting your own uh, reputation or your own political power on the line to help someone. And I think that is so critical, especially for people who may not have had those opportunities in the past. When you have someone in a position of power to do that for you, I think that's critical. Um, you know, I, I don't know if, uh, it, just to answer your question directly, I'm not sure if people are necessarily aware of it, but I think that as a byproduct of getting to know someone and saying, wow, this person really cares, they take initiative, they're thoughtful, they work hard, then as a byproduct of that, sponsorship will like kind of fall out of that organically. So I think that's part of it is like, even if it's not labeled as sponsorship, it kind of happens. The other thing is, don't be afraid to ask, right? Like once you've developed a rapport with someone, and you feel like, hey, there's a position I'm really interested in, and that person can help me. I think a lot of people just um, they reject themselves from an opportunity, right? So it's not tacky, too. Oh, not at all. I mean, I feel like th there's a tacky way of doing it, but there's also a non-tacky way of making that ask, right? And so I think the question then becomes, how do you now make that ask in a way which is respectful to that person and um, you know reflects well on you? But yeah, I think certainly like. The best, like what I tell people actually is that if you, for example, are applying for jobs and you tell me that you applied to five jobs and you got five offers, that's a bad sign. Like you should be getting rejected at least, I don't know, half the time. 
So if you're like uh, going up for a position, you're going for a promotion, you're going for a new job and you're not getting rejected, then you're not doing it well. And so like coming back to your point, Mickey, like if you're making an ask and you are afraid you're getting rejected, that's a good sign. Like you should be putting yourself out there enough such that you're getting told no. Um, and, that, and that's a sign of that you're stretching yourself. That makes sense. You're not playing a big enough game. Exactly, Thank exactly, you. yeah. Thank you very much. And I've certainly felt this because like we, with Taro, like, I'll just share one quick anecdote. With Taro, we um, went through Y Combinator and we tried to get funding. And I'll tell you, like anyone who's tried to do fundraising before, you're gonna, like you have to get used to getting rejected again and again and again. <laughs> and so um, it's tough because like what'll happen often in the venture fundraising landscape is like you have a friend or a mentor or someone and you'll say, hey, like, you know, this venture capitalist, can you introduce me? And when you, when you make that call, you're basically asking them to sponsor you. Like, hey, Rahul is not going to waste your time. He's a respectable founder and he has a good idea. And then what will often happen is I'll make my pitch and that per the person I pitch will reject me. And I get really nervous. Like, okay, did that mean that I just kind of ruined my relationship with the person who did the introduction too? Because like they, they vouched for me. And so like, you have to be okay with um, rejection and also like not taking everything so, so personally that, okay, this is now building the relationship. Okay, um, Veronica, go ahead. Hey Rahul, um, thank you so much. This has been informative, but I kind of want to dig deeper on the add value portion. I think oftentimes a lot of the um, examples are surface level <laughs> because if everyone is kind of pulling out the same tricks out of the book, like what are some other ways to add value? Because if I'm coming to you as a junior developer or someone who is very early in my career, like what are some ways that I can add value if the person that I'm seeking like either mentorship from um, is in like, I guess a better place or like, you know, doing better in their career. like. What are some ways that you can add value? Yeah, okay. So I think it, it it definitely depends a bit on the context. So for example, if you're working in a job already and you're the like new on the team, right? You're the new person on the team. One way to add value is just to um, make observations and say, hey, like, I'm trying to think of a good example. Like I noticed that in the past 10 PRs that you put out, there are these patterns. And I wonder, like, do you think it makes sense to have a helper function, which can make this easier? Or do you think it makes sense to refactor this file? And like, even if it's a horrible idea, the fact that you're like putting yourself out there and trying to improve the life of that person or the life of the, the code quality or the kind of quality of life for the whole team, that's very commendable. And I really want to talk to you now. Like, I, like you've, you've kind of um, proven that you you care, right? So that's like one way of adding value. Another thing, um, which is not a direct answer to your question, but I think um, what what will often happen, I found, is like people will get some response from someone, like, oh, like I can't find the documentation. Like, can you point me to it? Or like, what method should I use here? Whatever the question might end up being, and then they'll they'll get the answer and they'll move on with their life. I think one big way of adding value is to come back to that person and say. Thank you for that. You helped unblock this thing, which now let me um, finish my project on time. Or you helped me, you, you pointed me in the right direction. And from that, I learned this other thing, which was hugely impactful. Thank you so much. I'd love to like um, learn more from you, right? So I think the value that I get there, if you actually did that legwork of like coming back to me and updating me is, wow, this person learned, like this person learn from my feedback, which makes me feel good. And they're actually thanking me. Um, and it had a huge impact for them or the company or whatever. Um, and so that I think is another really powerful way of adding value. And then the final thing I'll say is like, just sharing your own experience could be valuable. Like, you know, what I started out on YouTube making tutorials and I had been doing Android for like 10 years, like five or six years at that point. So I, I, I knew my way around Android, but what I found is that sometimes the people who are just starting out on Android, they actually learned better from someone who was also starting out on Android rather than someone like me. So just the fact that you're new to something and you have fresh eyes, like a novel perspective, that can be in incredibly valuable. So just like, you know, I think making observations or noticing patterns from your fresh perspective, um, that, that all I think is constitutes as major value. 
Okay, yeah, thank you. So just essentially being proactive um, and basically also being grateful for whatever or kind of circling back and letting them know yeah. how it was helpful. So, yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's a great summary. Said it better than me. Okay, so I know Nasir, you have your hand raised. Can I actually quickly, because we don't have that much time left, let me quickly run through the um, negotiation portion and then I'll, I'll, I'll come to you. I just want to make sure that we have enough time to get through that. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, thanks. Okay. thanks a lot for doing that. Okay, so um, the last portion I have is about negotiation. So the idea here is that, hey, um, a lot of us are looking for a job right now. Um, and let's say you get in that very fortunate position that you get an offer. What can you do now to actually negotiate, right? So the first IQ test, if you will, is if you're working in the US at you know a, a big tech company, there are going to be multiple parts of your offer. And so the first IQ test is which parts of the offer actually matter. So when you get on the phone with the recruiter and they tell you, they're going to kind of give you a ton of information. Like, oh, here's your salary, your equity, your signing bonus, performance bonus, 401k match, pay time off, health insurance, catered meals, free. Like, you know, when I was at Meta, they had like a game room. They had, uh, you know, a learning budget. They had a gym. They had all this stuff. And so the first thing you should figure out is which of these things actually matter to you? Like, which of these actually have a meaningful dollar value or which of these will actually make your life better? And so very quickly, what you'll find is, at least for me, um, everything that I've crossed out actually doesn't have that much dollar value. And so if you're trying to figure out jo between job A and job B, like, oh, wow, that company number, company B has a much better gem. That is not the right way to evaluate a company. And the thing is, if you think about the time that you talk to the recruiter, they might spend 20 or 30% of the conversation talking about how good the perks are, but you should ignore all of that because what you really care about are these things that I haven't crossed out. And even among these, you should also think about what can the company actually change for you, right? Um, like what are the options for negotiation? And I would argue that at pretty much every company that I'm aware of, the 401k match, the pay time off, the health insurance and bonus, those are things that are typically not up for negotiation. Like you can't tell them, hey, I wanna have 30% more 401k match. They're probably not gonna do that for you, right? Typically, when a company negotiates, they're going to negotiate on those top three components, the salary, the equity, and the signing bonus. And so um, takeaway number one, when you think about negotiation, is that you're negotiating along multi multiple dimensions, and these are the three that matter. And so oftentimes, you like a lot of people I talk to you are like, oh, they're giving me $100,000 a year, but I want $105,000 a year. Right? But I think that's like a very one-dimensional way of looking at negotiation. You should think about, hey, the salary. The signing bonus is equity. And I could actually go down on my salary and get oh, more equity. Right? Yeah, I'm with Sean, I'm playing with your e team. Your team. Okay. So takeaway number two, should you negotiate? Right? And the answer is yes. It's always yes. Um, let, me let me explain why. Um, number one, it's lucrative. Right? I... Um, I got an offer from Meta back in 2014 and I sent one email and they increased my signing bonus by $50,000. 50K for any of us is life-changing money. Like I literally could go and like buy a car or like I could save that money, right? 50K is huge for any of us, but for a company like Meta or Google or Airbnb, 50K is nothing. They, they couldn't care less. If, they, if you told Airbnb, like you will get a good engineer if you just pay $50,000, they would do that trade in a heartbeat. And so just think about there's an asymmetry here of like you negotiating is really powerful for you. It's like yet another day in the company, a normal day in the life for the company. And keep in mind that you're not hurting anyone, right? Like if you're going to get a job at these big tech companies, you actually are not, um, it's not like, okay, I got an extra 20K in my salary. That means that 20K is coming out of the paycheck from the next guy over. That's not how it works. Right. Typically, there's like a budget for um, salary, and it's like these companies are wildly profitable, or they have like huge balance sheets, and so um, it's not like you're hurting the bottom line of the company in any meaningful way. I mean, if you go to like a three-person startup and they have six months of runway, then maybe yeah, like you should be mindful that there there's maybe some ramification on the burn rate. But for any reasonable company, like Series B or later, you're not really going to hurt anyone. 
Um, the other thing is that like some people are afraid of negotiation because like, oh, what if they, what if it reflects poorly on me? In almost all the cases I've seen, it's the opposite. When you say, hey, here's my experience. Here's what I'm worth. I'd love to figure out a mutually beneficial agreement. You're actually signaling confidence, right? You're, you're saying something that I know what I'm worth and I want to make sure that I'm compensated adequately. It's a good thing. It's not being reflected poorly on you. And then, like I said, it's insanely high ROI. I literally sent, I think, two emails and I hopped on a call with the recruiter at Meta and that translated to 50K additional for me, which is like, I can't, I can't overstate how life-changing that can be for an individual person, right? Um, okay, so tactics. How do you actually negotiate? Um, there are a couple, couple things I want to point out. One is that you should only negotiate when you have an offer. Um, a lot of companies will say, hey, like, we don't want to waste your time. Just tell us what number you would sign with right now, and then we'll continue with the interview. That's a bad idea. Just say, hey, right now, I'm much more interested in um, making sure that we're a good fit for each other. I'm sure we can come to an agreement on the numbers later on. But for now, I'd love to just keep going with the interview process. So like politely and firmly say no, that no, you're not going to negotiate now. You're going to wait until they give you an offer in writing. And keep in mind that once they have interviewed you and they are giving you an offer, they've probably spent 10 hours or 20 hours internally and talking to you and they're invested. So right now, at that point, you have leverage. Before you have gone through the process, you don't really have that much leverage. And then like, like we said before at the beginning, um, think about the multiple levers of the offer. You have a salary, you have equity, you have sign-on. So talk about, so like if they say to you, hey, you know what? We really can't offer you more than 100K of salary. Sorry. Then you say, okay, that's fine. If that's the rule, that's totally fine. But let's talk about the other components. Like what, where, where are you flexible, right? That, that's like a more open-ended way of phrasing it, which will lead to better negotiation. Okay, and then the number one rule, I'm sure many of you have heard this before, but the number one rule with negotiation is don't say a number first. So there are so many companies that will um, try and kind of trick you into revealing a number such that you would sign. And this is so common that California actually made a law recently where they, are, they forbid employers from asking you, asking you your previous salary. So if that ever gets brought up in California, and I think there's a couple other states as well, but in California, that's illegal. So keep that in mind. But there are things that the recruiter will do to kind of bypass that and still be legal, but effectively they're asking the same question, which is they'll say things like, I need to know your salary range. And so the correct answer here is, hey, right now I'm more concerned about understanding if this is a good opportunity for both of us, and we can talk about salary later. Again, we can't move forward without a number. And then you just ask, throw the question back at them. What are the typical compensation bands for this role? Um, okay, and then I think this is the last slide of content I have. Um, be firm. So when you're negotiating, I think that it's easy to make it combative. And I think it's your job to try and make it more like you're coming to a mutual agreement where everyone's happy rather than it being, I'm fighting with the recruiter, right? That's not typically how you want to run these things. So you want to be firm and direct about what you're looking for, but always you want to make sure that you're kind. You're not ever lying about, you know, what numbers you have or what offers you have. One thing you can do though is introduce delay. So a lot of the times the recruiter will say, "Hey, can you hop on a call? I want to just get, I want to get um, some feedback from you." And almost always I'll say no, because if you think about it. The recruiter has probably talked to a thousand people about negotiation and landing an offer. I have talked to maybe five in my whole career. And so who do you think has more experience and who do you think is better at negotiation? Them, right? So if I hop on a call and they try and pressure me, I probably will mess it up. And so typically what I'll do is I will not commit to anything. I'll, I'll say, hey, I actually don't want to talk on the phone. Could you share whatever details you have over email? And then if, they, if I do hop on a call with them, then I'll basically introduce delay. I'll say, yeah, thank you for the information. Um, let me talk this over with my partner, my dog, my, 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 my mom or dad. Or, hey, right now I'm out. Let me get back to my apartment. I'll do some thinking about it. And then I will get back to you, right? So that way you want to get, you want to remove yourself some, from the situation of someone saying, hey, do you accept the offer? Yes or no, right? You should never, ever kind of bend to that kind of pressure. 
Okay, and here's one other tip, uh, like life hack. Whenever someone gives you a number or they say something, the correct answer almost always is just to say interesting. Like someone says, hey, here's, here's your offer. What do you think? Just say interesting. So that way you're like, you're not saying, oh my gosh, that's the best thing in the, in the world. And you accept it immediately. And now you're leaving money on the table. Or if you say, um, you know, oh, that's so bad. Like, I hate that offer. Like, that's probably not a good place to start negotiation from. Just say interesting. And then think about it a bit more. Give yourself time to, to think. I like what Lorianne is saying here. Give yourself time to think and reflect. And then maybe later on in the conversation or, you know, in another email altogether, you can then come back with a more formal ask. But that word interesting is a really good thing to give yourself buffer. Okay, that's all I had. So um, I, I'm around just to take questions, but I'll just give one, one plug for, for what, I, what I've been working on for the past year. Taro, the idea of Taro is that we wanna really help engineers get better in their career. And so like I mentioned at the beginning, the idea is that um, we try and help people with answers from you know directors of engineering, tech leads, mid-level engineers, engineers junior engineers, they're all on Taro helping each other. And so if you are looking for that community of credible people, then I think Taro is a good, good fit. We also have case studies. So every week or two, we will have a live presentation from a senior engineer or higher talking about what they've done. And so it's a really good way to, to learn from these people directly. And you also have a community. We have a Slack community and we have um, a web app and a mobile app that um, you're, you're welcome to join for free. And there's also a paid option too. And so Abby mentioned to me that um, having like a discount code would be super valuable. And I'm, I'm very happy to provide that here. Let me put it in the chat. Um, so if you go to jointaro.com slash membership, that's the URL. Then if you apply that code, you can get 30% off. So, I mean, definitely, I'm not trying to make this like a sales pitch, but um, there's a ton of stuff for free on Taro too. Um, check it out, jointaro.com. And if you do want to, if you like the content here and you want more like this, then I would love to be able to talk to each of you individually um, through Taro and you can use that discount code. Okay. So with that, um, I don't know if Esco, if you're free now or, or Abby, but I'll, I'll hand it over to you. And then with whatever remaining time we have after that, then we can um, take questions.